Abby Davison, welcome to the Development by David podcast. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a such a pleasure. I've really enjoyed your content on numerous podcasts and I've enjoyed more so your book, Money and Love, an Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions. I want to unpick the roadmap Abby Davison has navigated. Can you tell me how you went from studying at Stanford to then co-authoring a book with your Stanford professor? That's pretty pretty remarkable. Well, I consider myself so fortunate to have been able to study with my co-author, um, Myra Strober. She's a pioneering labor economist and the first female faculty member hired at Stanford Business School. And before I took her class, I think like many people in their early and mid-20s, I had a hard time knowing how to approach big life decisions. Nobody taught me how to do that. I just um, kind of forged my way through, but I had big decisions I was facing, such as should I move to a new city if I don't have a job there, but I really want to live there? And if I'm uh, dating someone and things seem to be going well, you know, how do we decide what to, you know, whether to take our relationship to the next level and what does that even look like? And so when I took Myra's class, this light bulb went off for me because I realized that the reason that I had so much trouble making those big life decisions is that the conventional wisdom I had been taught was completely flawed. We are taught that we should make financial decisions with our heads and not let our emotions interfere. And we should make relationship decisions with our hearts and not overthink those things. And really, all of life's biggest decisions have an element of head, have an element of heart, have money and love uh, all together. And if you approach those decisions holistically, you are more able to make a decision that feels uh, aligned with your values, that you have considered from all angles, and that you are less likely to regret. And so uh, I actually took the class with the man I was dating at the time. He and I had met in business school. We had... um, gotten to know each other, things were moving quickly, but we were suddenly faced with graduation and we had to decide if we were going to accept jobs in the same city and then if we were going to live together if we ended up in the same city. And Myra had shared a statistic in her class. She's a labor economist, so there were always lots of statistics. And so she shared the statistic that couples that live together before getting married have higher divorce rates. And really? That, yes. It seemed so surprising to us, very counterintuitive. And we didn't want that to happen to us. I mean, we were we were not picturing that things would go that way, but it was it was likely, um, as the statistics said. So we dug into that for our final paper and found out that there actually is one thing you can do to counteract those negative outcomes, and that is be intentional. And so rather than just slide into a shared roommate situation with your partner, um, make a conscious decision, lay out what will be different in your relationship once you're living together, how you will merge finances, how you will divide chores. And when you do that, those negative outcomes are removed, um, that you don't have that, you don't see that cohabitation effect. And so we wrote the paper together. We then went on to live together, to get married, to have two young kids. And we went back to Myra's class as guest speakers for a decade as we were both climbing the corporate ladders in our respective careers. And the further that I got out, the more I realized that her class had really changed our lives. And one day we were having lunch. This was after she retired and she had told me she was going to write a book about the class. And I said to her, how's the book going? And she said, well, I haven't written a word. (laughs) And I said, uh, I had actually just founded the first uh, employee resource group for parents at my employer, Gap Inc. And I did it with a working dad who was a lawyer and I couldn't have done it without him. So I said, maybe you need an accountability partner. And she looked at me and said, that's a great idea, but I need more than that. I need a co-author and you have been 
putting the lessons in the cl from the class into work uh, for the last decade plus. You've been in the trenches and you would be the perfect person to write this book with me. So that is how I went from studying with her to being a co-author. And it has been such a fabulous journey and a wonderful gift to get to collaborate with her in this way. And now you're at service to so many with that book. Congratulations. That's such a full circle moment. Of, uh, I love hearing that, Abby. In all superhero films, they always say things such as, with great power comes great responsibility. Given the fact that you've written a book or co-authored a book all about decision making gives me the impression that you're a subject matter expert when it comes to making uh, life consequential decisions. What are some of the biggest decisions you've personally made that have shaped the character of the person that's on the other side of this call with me today? Well, I think some of the biggest decisions I've made have been risks in that I didn't know how they would turn out at the time. So I did move across the country after I graduated from university. Where did uh, you move to? Uh, to San Francisco. So I grew up uh, on the East Coast. Uh, um, I grew up in New Jersey and I went to school in Connecticut. And then uh, I wanted to see the rest of the country. And so I moved to San Francisco without a job uh, right after I graduated from university and had some friends who were finding an apartment there. So I had a room, uh, but I needed to figure out what I was going to do for work. And I did a lot of, I knew what I wanted to do. Um, I did a lot of informational interviews. I wanted to work with nonprofits, NGOs at the strategy level. So I interviewed uh, a lot of people to find out more about their work and how I could find my way to that and ended up in um, Bain Consulting's nonprofit arm, uh, the Bridgespan Group, which had spun out of the for-profit arm. And so, uh, but before I got that job, I took a part-time job in retail so I could fund, pay my rent and fund my life while I continued looking for the job and um, and kind of did, I moved across the country again without a job because of a relationship. And so there were lots of times in my life where I made decisions that on paper looked risky, but I took steps to mitigate those risks and I experimented, um, which I think is really important. And I, I was fortunate to um, have parents who had largely funded my education. And so I had some savings with which I could take risks. And uh, I know that's not the case for everyone. However, I do think that um, taking, taking uh, calculated risks is really important. And uh, I continue to do that. I took a leap when I wrote the book. Uh, I actually was working a full-time job when I was writing the book. And then it became very clear that I wasn't going to be able to share the book to promote the book um, while I was in a full time job. And so uh, the book was pulling me and the message was pulling me so much that I took the leap. I'm still in the middle of that leap. And I know that because I have followed the process that I lay out in the book, uh, which I know we'll get into uh, our five step decision making framework, I have so much confidence that even though I don't know exactly how this will all play out, um, I feel great about the decision that I made and I would do it again in a heartbeat. Amazing, Abby. What is wrong with our traditional untrained approach to making decisions? Well, certainly I, I think we compartmentalize decisions, right? We think that career decisions need to be analyzed and to be thought about with our heads and you shouldn't let your emotions interfere. And on the other hand, relationship decisions, decisions about who you uh, might want to partner with for the long term, even get married with, should really be made with your heart and not be, uh, not let financial matters interfere. Uh, and the reason that that's so wrong is that, as I mentioned before, I mean, all of life's biggest decisions have components of money and components of love. And so you really can't only um, focus on one. We also tend to make decisions really quickly. So as humans, we are uh, have this bias towards not wanting to be uncomfortable. I mean, it makes total sense, right? Who wants to just linger in that uh, state of uncertainty, of anxiety, of fear, of any of those emotions that we think of as negative? And so we often rush to the other side of a decision 
just to get it over with. It almost doesn't even matter what we decide. We just don't want to be in that uncertainty anymore. And so one of the things we really advocate in our book is to slow down the decision-making process to turn over different rocks, if you will, by following our framework so that you aren't acting impulsively based on emotion or based on the desire to get out of a discomfortable feeling. It almost follows that kind of Daniel Kahneman's like um, system one and system two type thinking, doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what, what Daniel Kahneman wrote about in Thinking Fast and Slow is that we have two systems that govern our our decisions. And the first system, system one, is quick and impulsive and easier to access. And it's when, you know, we're, we're being chased by a woolly beast <laughs> way back when. Um, we would access that system and have fight or flight or freeze. Um, Abby, I'm in Glasgow. I'm chased by those most days. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> um, and system two is slower. It's harder to access. And it's a system that governs our rational thinking, our strategic decision making. And we need to be able to access that, but it, it's harder. And so again, you're absolutely right that we are trying with our framework and the book to help people access system two and help them slow down so they're not uh, just making decisions based on impulse. Fantastic. As you alluded to earlier, the core of your book is based on the five C's that you lay out. Clarity, communicate, choices, check in and consider. And when I reflect on your sentiment around how humans try to avoid feeling uncomfortable, well, a great re remedy for that is your first C, clarity. If I were to ask you to unravel clarity, how would one give themselves mental clarity to make a successful decision? Well, it's so much easier said than done. Um, for a couple of reasons. The first is that our wants, what we want, is very powerfully governing, governed by what others want. So there is a French philosopher, René Girard, who coined this term mimetic desire. And it means that exactly that, that we want things primarily because others want them. And so we might be very happy renting a flat, but if we see all of our friends trying to buy a place, we might start thinking that we're behind because we haven't bought a place for ourselves yet. And we might start thinking, oh, that's what I want, too. So um, society, our parents, uh, role models, they're very influential. And part of getting clarity on what we want is separating our wants from what we see others wanting and what we see our parents wanting. And one way to do that is to get in touch with your core values. And that is, you know, those are kind of the North stars that guide um, what makes you, you. And there's lots of exercises for how to do that. You can go online and Google values sort, and there's all sorts of um, uh, exercises to do online. But there are also ways you can start paying attention when you read the paper and consume media to see what, what gets you fired up. What do you think is deeply unfair? What do you read about and you can't help but having an emotional reaction to? And those are the things that kind of touch a nerve because they're connected to a core value. I love the point around mimetic desire. I think I read Luke Burgess's book and he re writes about how we don't want what other people want, but we want what we think other people want. Have you came across that book or that concept? Yes, absolutely. We read the book as part of our research, and, and it, is, um, it's, it is so interesting once you have your eyes open to how powerful mimetic desire is, just to see where it, where it um, plays out. I, I have two young sons, and I often see one of them you know, will pick up a toy that they haven't played with in months and all of a sudden the other one will want that toy 
instantly, right? Like both of them, you know, couldn't care less about it. But just because one wanders over and the other one sees, it's like that's the only one that he needs to <laughs> play with for that moment. And that's, you know, it's sort of our signal for what is valuable if we see other people gravitating to something. Um, and so that's just to be aware of that phenomenon and start realizing when you're pulled towards something, asking yourself, why is that? Why, why do I want this promotion or why do I um, think that I want to find a life partner? Like, is that something I want in my core or is that just something I see my friends doing and I movies and social media are telling me um, that's what I should be striving towards? Abby, have you heard that both Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk filter decisions through what they call their single guiding principles? Have you came across that? Yeah, whereby they, whereby they funnel um, decisions through one question. For Elon Musk, it is, will this get me closer to Mars? And for Jeff Bezos, in terms of making decisions for Amazon, it's, will this improve customer service? Would you recommend the listener have, that they would have a single guiding principle, or do you think that's a flawed approach? Well, I think that makes sense for a business, um, but I don't know that that makes sense for a human, um, because we are very multifaceted, right? And so we might have multiple goals that we are um, that we aspire to across a number of different dimensions so if you have one if you know you're so crystal clear on your purpose that you're able to have a single gating question great but for me i have a purpose that i strive for for my work I have a purpose in my family and my relationships with them. I have a purpose when it comes to my own growth and development. And so I, I have um, multiple priorities that I'm trying to make sure that I'm realizing at any given time. And I'm not saying I'm striving for this perfect balance because we can get into why that doesn't exist. but. Um, I, I don't think that there is one dimension that I am trying to optimize at any given time. Um, but I also think everyone's perspective might be different. Um, and, and if you are able to get down to that single dimensional question um, and that works for you, great. And it might actually at, a different, at different times in your life. So if you are, um, you know, in a situation where um, you, I mean, often I think health is the first thing to get go to the wayside. And very quickly when it does, you realize, oh, if I don't have health, right, the expression health is wealth, right? If I don't have my health, then it's very hard to pursue the other goals. So sometimes actually you're forced to have a singular focus on one thing in order to um, move towards other goals. <laughs> I'm assuming there will be times in one's life where they have to go against their own personal values and their north stars because of because of the impact on greater good or for a better more universal outcome for others. Do you have any advice on people navigating that labyrinth whereby the right decision isn't actually the right decision for their core personal values? Hmm. I think that's a tricky one um, because there's a lot of cognitive dissonance when you are going against your core values. And so I think it's important to just be very clear about why it is that you're making that decision. Um, one of the things that is uh, interesting as I continue to learn as a parent, I've, I've, my older son is uh, 10 and a half almost. So I've, I've had a, over, a little over a decade of learning um, where the right decision in the short term um, or, or the right decision is actually not what will make things easier in the short term, right? So there are times where as a parent and your kid is, you know, whining about something they just want, you know, um, to stay up late. Like, yeah, it would be easier if you, you know, you're tired, you don't want to, you know, stop what you're doing and kind of put them to bed or fight them on that. But if you don't do that, it's going to make everyone's life unhappy in the morning. Um, and so often you have to make these decisions in the short term that are actually not making people happy, but it's for the longer term good. And so if you're making one of those decisions where you're like, I'm going against the thing I want to do now, 
but it's because it's going to help me in the long run. Just be very clear about that with yourself. And, um, and, and I think, you know, it gets to our last C, which is consequences, where you're actually trying to project out the consequences of a decision across different time horizons, right? Short term, medium and long term. And we are, again, as humans, very biased to look at the short term impacts of our decisions. Um, but if you're very clear that, again, you're making this decision in the short term, but it's going to have benefits in the long term, that could help. Um, but yeah, I think core values are so important. It's very important to listen to them when something is telling us that we're violating one of them in one way. It's, it's um, hard to ignore that for a long time. That's such a pragmatic action and insight for the listener i want to move on to communication uh, when reading your book it was like such a predominant theme throughout why is it important to communicate your decision with others around you when it's your own decision to make yeah no it's interesting i mean we humans are not islands um we exist in relation with other people and often we think that the more we know someone the better we know someone we almost make assumptions about what they're going to think about a decision. And so sometimes we think, oh, we don't even have to ask that person. I already know what they're going to say. But the truth is that um, we don't always know what they're going to say. They might have a reaction that's different than the one that we imagined in our mind. And our decisions have impacts on other people. And so by communicating what you want and why you are making a certain decision, it allows the other person to then share their own perspective. It allows them to, you know, hopefully they have clarified um, in their own mind what it is they want, and then they're able to respond in a way that gives you an insight into what they think. And we like to say that clarify and communicate are a bit of a dance. Um, you might clarify what you want, share it with someone else. They have clarified and then responded. And that might actually get you to change your perspective a bit. And so you're, it's an iterative um, dynamic. And um, often when we think about communication, we really think about talking, right? We think about what we want to say, how we're going to convince someone. Um, but communication is so much about listening. And not just creating the space to hear someone else, but actually letting yourself be influenced by what they're saying so that your mind isn't 100% made up and it can actually change depending on their reaction. And also creating the conditions for communication. And so what I mean by that is not just um, bringing something up you know, at, at the time that it pops into your head, right? Um, you wouldn't, if, it, if you're in a professional situation and you want to ask for a raise, you wouldn't like just pass by your boss in the hallway and say, hey, by the way, I've been thinking I should get paid more, right? You would like, set up a meeting, you would, you know, assemble the facts, have your data. And, and, you know, we don't, we're not that deliberate sometimes with the people who are, you know, we might be living with, um, whether it's a roommate or a romantic partner, we will bring something up when we're brushing our teeth at the end of the day, or when, you know, we're rushing out the door in the morning. And really what I have found in my own life that works so much better is making an appointment, actually saying, hey, there's something big on my mind I want to talk to you about. And I'm hoping we can do that this weekend or when might be a good time for you. And then actually get out of your day to day. Don't, you know, stay in the house with the dirty dishes and the sink and the piles of laundry, like get out of the everyday chaos and find somewhere that you can have a more expansive conversation. For, for my husband and I, that tends to be on hikes. We like to go out into nature and we let our kids run up ahead and we actually then are able to think expansively we're also not facing each other is something about like walking side by side with someone where you're not like staring deep into each other's eyes where you can be more vulnerable and share some of the things that you might not share when you're you know in a different setting so that is something we found that works for us one of the concepts that really illuminated me was this acronym TCOB, taking care of business. Can you bring that to life for the listener? I feel like it's very attuned to what we're talking about. Yeah, so we um, have a standing meeting on our calendars that um, is called Taking Care of Business. And it started um, before we had kids, actually, where we were just, you know, 
we were living together, but we were working actually quite different hours. My husband was working um, New York City market hours, so he was already out of the house, you know, um, long before I woke up in the morning. Uh, and he would get home, you know, quite tired uh, at the end of his day, you know, many hours before I would get home. And so we needed to be able to have dedicated time to talk about everything that's involved in running a household together. And now, you know, the kids have entered the picture, the logistics are like 10x more complicated of, you know, who's doing the pickup at this time and who's doing the drop off. And so it's just a time where we talk about, you know, go through every day in the week, talk about who's doing what. Um, he handles all the food shopping and cooking. And um, so he'll, you know, ask, we talk about like recipes that he's thinking about trying. We'll talk about um, one of our kids is having a birthday in a couple of weeks. So we'll talk about what we're doing for to celebrate that. And so it's just a dedicated time to handle all the life admin stuff that sometimes, you know, could fall through the cracks or somebody might start feeling resentful if they don't have, you know, that opportunity to bring it up and, you know, discuss how it's going to get done. And because it's planned and on the calendar, it just happens. It's not like anyone's nagging anyone else to say like, hey, we really haven't talked about this. It's just one of those things that's like set it and forget it. I'm a big fan of like removing friction from our lives. And if you can have a system that does that, um, which our TCOB meetings do, it, uh, it definitely helps the weeks go more smoothly. So does the term decision fatigue exist because it seems like tcob removes that or at least reduces it to an acceptable level yeah i mean i certainly believe in decision fatigue and um anyone who has ever had to um i mean we we both like to do a lot of research on everything we're what we call uh, maximizers uh where you're trying to kind of maximize the the a product or a experience and, um, I've heard that term in the dating community, maximizers, where you um, try to get the most out of every relationship, so you bypass on numerous dates because you're looking to find the ideal um, candidate. Oh, yeah, interesting. Well, I think that is dangerous. Um, so we could talk about that. But um, but yeah, when you have that tendency, um, you can actually, you know, research everything, you know, to a, a wild degree. We actually have a quiz on our website that talks about. Um, what kind of money and love decision maker you are. And there are folks who do overanalyze everything. And, um, and those analyzers can get decision fatigue because like every decision feels so fraught. And if you don't find like the absolute perfect everything, whether it's like a black t-shirt or a, you know, a model of a camera, then, you know, you feel like, you know, you failed and there's something better out there. Um, but there are definitely ways to counteract that. I think, I think having something set on the calendar, like our TCOBs, now are very short um, because we have these systems and we have um, a clear process in place for how we approach things. And it does cut down on decision fatigue because we don't have to say, okay, you know, who's cooking dinner tonight or who's doing that? It's like, no, we have it set and we certainly can bring something up if it feels like it's not working for one of us. But otherwise there's a default and that goes a long way towards reducing decision fatigue. I love that, Abby. I love the implementation of that system. Them. I'm sure uh, many of the listeners are noting that down. If they were to want to kind of hardwire or install that system into their current relationship or their, their current household in order to make better decisions on a daily basis, given that both money and love are such intense um, factors, how does one begin to evoke such an emotive conversation well, I like to say, blame the book or blame your podcast. Say, I was listening to this author, you know, talk to David on his podcast. And, you know, I'm taking no blame, Abby. I'm passing the blame to you. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm happy to take the blame. I'm happy to take the blame. Um, but yeah, just say, hey, you know, she suggested it might be a good experiment if we tried having a regular meeting in our lives to talk about, you know, some of the things that we, um, don't that we don't like to look at directly, right? Money and love are so fraught and they're so um, weighty that we often want to push them off. And we're like, no, this is fun. We don't want to, you know, talk about that. But first of all, you can have fun. I mean, I know friends who have their um, weekly 
TCOB conversations at a local bar. They get some drinks. They do it, you know, Friday before they have to go home and relieve the nanny or pick up their kids from daycare. And they like make it a date. And um, it could be lighthearted. But having something regular that is you're expecting it, um, it's just scheduled certainly starts to take some of the weight off of it. And you can, you know, the TCOB is about logistics, but you can also, we've called like separate meetings to talk about, you know, other big life concepts. Um, we had a whole discussion during COVID about moving and um, we would often have those conversations on hikes, as I mentioned, but we found that we had to actually uh, designate times to talk about th that question because otherwise it was like squ swirling in the background the whole time and just this like underlying level of stress that we didn't want. And so we knew we're like, okay, we're going to talk about this this weekend. Let's not bring it up again until then. So that again, you were kind of were free from the question until that designated time. And I've heard people suggest scheduling time to worry. Like if you're somebody who ruminates on things, be like, okay, for 15 minutes, I'm going to worry about this thing. And then I'm going to move on. And sometimes when something has a designated time, it's actually very freeing because you realize you don't have to think about it the rest of the time. I couldn't agree more. In a similar vein, I have, and I may have mentioned this on the podcast before, when I have a thought, I always note it down, whether it's an actionable thought or non-actionable thought. After reading um, David Allen's work, where he says the brain's for having ideas, not storing them. And I guess that's the same for worries and decisions. The brain's for having the decisions or having worries, not storing them or addressing worries, not storing them. Um, and I think your concept there, like designating a time to worry is contrary as it sounds or weird as it sounds or as abstract as it sounds, it sounds like a, an, an actual practice under the hood. It sounds like such a good piece of advice. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I love um, getting things out of your head. And I just was listening to, there's another podcast um, that Jesse Hempel has called Hello Monday that uh, she talks about, um, did an episode recently about having a second brain. And it's that same idea of getting everything down out of your head and capturing it so that um, you're not wondering, you know, oh, did I like do the three things that I thought about when I woke up in the middle of the night? It's just like, get it down. And then you have the second brain outside of your brain. I love that. I must check that out. I want to move on to choices. And this current what would I call maybe an information economy where we have more choices than ever before? What effects does having more possible choices have on someone's ability to make a decision and therefore a good quality decision? Well, certainly the paradox of choice exists, right? This idea that the more choices you have, the more paralyzing it can be, and therefore you don't make a decision. Um, but I think more often what happens when we're facing a big decision is that we get a bit of tunnel vision and we start to see things in binary terms, right? We think about, do I um, want to marry this person or should we break up? Or should I go for the promotion or quit this job, right? So there are really many choices in between those two extremes, but because we're under stress and we're, you know, might be um, feeling uh, just heightened senses of emotion in general, we have a hard time seeing those creative options and those those uh, gray areas on the spectrum, right? We see the black and we see the white. And so part of the choices step that we advocate is generating additional creative options, not so that you're overwhelmed by the paradox of choice, but because you might uncover um, something that's a really elegant solution that you hadn't considered before. And so I'll give you an example. I talked about um, the moving decision that my husband and I were making at, um, a couple of years ago, and we, we needed more space. It was like the height of COVID and our kids were uh, zooming into their remote kindergarten and grade two from our <laughs> dining room table. And uh, we had some university tutors coming in to help them get on Zoom school. And it just, we were both doing our jobs from separate houses. So we, some separate rooms in our house. So we just felt like we needed more space. And um, the way to get that was to move. Well, when we kind of went through the rest of the steps and um, particularly the consequences step, it, we realized that actually if we moved, um, it would have all these financial implications that would make it hard to do the thing that we really wanted uh, when we clarified, which was uh, pursue entrepreneurial paths. And so one of the choices that we ended up generating was um, to find additional space that wasn't, uh, didn't require a move. 
And so I'm speaking to you from an office that I rented a few blocks from where I live. And it was a way for me to get a space to do my work in that wasn't in our home. It didn't require moving. And so taking on, you know, all of the um, financial commitments and um, additional disruption that that entails. But that was a, a, an option that I hadn't seen until um, a friend actually uh, talked to me about the fact that she is also a writer and had rented an apartment um, outside of their home so that she could do her work there. And it was kind of like, oh, right, there is a third way sometimes that we don't see when we're really up close to that decision. In a similar vein, when using other sources, whether that's online primary information or secondary information, um, how do we use external information again whether that's through friends or through internet sources how do we effectively use and credentialize other external pieces of information to inform our own decision do you have like a a framework for that by any chance uh, well that's i mean certainly in this age of like ai and chat gpt like we we all need uh the framework for how to know if something is an accurate source i mean the truth is that there's no definitive way but certainly um i go back to the clarify step which is knowing yourself um and knowing what you really want because unless you know that then you know say you're you're asking people to weigh in on your decision to try to um get input they're they're going to um filter their advice through their own experience, right? And often people give advice that validates their own experience. And so you might, I'll, I'll go back to the conversation uh, we had in the, earlier about having a movie, when I moved to San Francisco without um, a job and I was having all these coffee chats with people, um, a lot of people said, well, if you want to work at uh, with NGOs at the strategy level, you should start working for an NGO, work your way up, maybe in five years or so, you'll be able to you know, be on their executive leadership team and then you'll be able to work on their strategy. And you know, certainly that was what they had done and that was the path that made sense to them, but it didn't make sense to me because all of my peers that I graduated with were going to work for these for-profit consulting firms they didn't have experience in a Fortune 500 company. They were getting to work on the strategy. So it just, you know, for me, it seemed like that's interesting advice. It wasn't, it, I, I didn't follow it. Um, so you kind of have to filter people's advice through what do you want? Is that the only way to get there? And consider the source, you know, uh, which I often, you know, ask people to do when they hear feedback is like, consider the source. I'm really enjoying these insights, Abby. When I had Seth Godin on the podcast, he taught me that a good outcome doesn't necessarily mean a good decision. And equally, a bad outcome doesn't actually mean a bad decision at times. External factors could have affected the result of your decision. Do you have any advice on, deta on detaching the quality of outcome from the quality constructed within a decision? Yes, and Annie Duke also talks about that and thinking in bets that we tend to conflate, um, you know, if something was a good decision with did the outcome, you know, go as you had expected it. And, you know, the truth is there are always um, monkey wrenches that get thrown at us, right? That things that happen, black swan events that we never anticipated uh, that seem to be happening more and more frequently these days. Uh, but, uh, and that's why I think it is really helpful to have a, a trusted process that you're following to make a decision because um, the outcome might go sideways um, in a way that you didn't expect. But if you feel that you have, you know, truly turned over all the rocks that you followed, a framework doesn't have to be ours. Um, we we do recommend ours. It is research based. Uh, but if you followed a framework and you've you know done your research, my co-author has an expression that her father used to say, you know, you've done your best. Angels couldn't do better. Angels couldn't do better. And so um, I love that because it does remind us that at, at some level, like the outcome is out of your control. All you can control is the process that you follow. And so you, the more you can separate um, a good outcome and a bad outcome from the process. And um, that's why, you know, I, I say I had so much more confidence when I was following this process than um, the, the risks that I took earlier in life that 
were you know just as risky as the risk I'm taking now. In some ways, I actually have taken on more risk now because I have kids, I have a mortgage, I have you know kind of um, all these obligations I didn't have in my early twenties. But um, I I have followed a trusted process, and that has given me a lot more confidence and and uh, a feeling of empowerment. I love this. I really do. I want to move on to check-in. Um, how important is it to share your dilemma or decision with those around you? Does this mean outsourcing your decision to other people or does it just mean reflavoring your own decision with what they have to say? It's such a good question. And, you know, it really depends on the decision. I think there are some decisions where they're very personal and it does not make sense to share them with everyone. Um, for example, the decision about uh, whether to have a child or um, to have another child. I mean, that is so personal and it is um, nobody else is going to raise that child for you. Right. So at the end of the day, and that's, that's one of the very few decisions that you can't undo. Right. Once you have a child and you bring it into this world, like, you cannot cannot say, actually, no, thanks. Um, <laughs> so, so that might not be a decision you want to, you know, talk with everyone you know uh, about. Uh, but there are other decisions like uh, when you're looking for a job that the research does show that talking to weak ties, you know, people who are your second and third degree connection on LinkedIn um, is very effective because those people have access to information and networks that are, you know, far from your own and will have different opportunities come across um, their desks. And so um, I think it depends on the type of decision. And then I think it, it also is something where you want to consider who you're asking. And so you might have uh, people in your life who you admire a great deal, you admire how they've made decisions. Um, and those are the people that you might want to consider um, asking, checking in with. And the way that I suggest that we that you check in is actually not to say, hey, I am facing this decision, what should I do? But ac actually ask them, hey, I'm facing this, this decision. I know it's one that you've faced in the past. Uh, can you share a little bit about your thought process or help me understand how you approach that decision? So what you're trying to get insight into is their approach, their thought process, as opposed to having them make your the decision for you. That's such sound advice. I, I absolutely love it. And last but not least, we'll have the last and final C, consequences. You're right about considering all realistic consequences of our choices, both good and bad. What consequences do you focus on, I guess? I mean, it would be really easy to catastrophize, for example, like leaving my job will mean I'm going, going to go, I'm going to go hungry and I'm going to go homeless. And that is somewhat unrealistic. How does one separate the healthy, realistic consequences from the unhealthy, unrealistic consequences? Do you have a model for that? Oh, that's such a good question. We actually don't get into that in our book, but I, I have um, read research about this idea of, you know, envision the worst case scenario and then envision the likelihood that that is going to happen. Um, and and so actually, <laughs> tell you the the story about when my husband and I were making our moving decision. We actually made a decision tree. I mean, this is the problem when you meet someone in business school; you get real nerdy. Um, I can tell you work for Bain and Company. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you, you made, we made a decision tree about the likelihood that the schools would continue to be closed uh, the following school year because that was something that you know we were um, also looking to change. Um, and, and so in that case, yeah, the worst case scenario was that the schools would be closed uh, you know another year. Our kids would not get to interact in person with any you know peers uh, and would, would have to do remote learning you know that much longer. And then we assigned that a probability. We said, well, what is the likelihood that that's going to happen? Now we were pessimists, so it turns out the schools did open, but we gave it a higher likelihood that they wouldn't. But you know when you can do that, when you can envision like the worst case scenario and then say, well, you know, how likely is that going to happen? It Then you start to realize like, okay, well, maybe I won't be homeless. Maybe it just means I will need to, you know, find a part-time job or take some contracting work um, until, you know, the next thing comes around. So there are ways really to um, to smooth out the consequences. And that's why we we actually encourage people to play out consequences on different time horizons. Again, because often the worst case scenario is like the 
the, you know, the one that we dwell on and we dwell on the negative outcomes because that is, you know, human nature. But if you're kind of forcing your brain to say, no, let's play out positives and negatives and let's do that across different time horizons, you start to realize, oh, okay, well, there, there could be some positive consequences and actually really positive consequences in the long term. That's just not where my brain went first. I love it. After listening to the five C's, I want to propose a sixth C, if you don't mind. It seems like a golden thread from what you've, it's a golden thread that wraps around what you've been speaking about. And if I were to add a, my own C, it would be confidence, um, that people ha should have the confidence to trust their gut or trust their sources to make a decision and to trust that they, they'll be able to manage the consequences if they do, do arise, that they'll be able to, to manage them. Um, how would you feel about that, Fortad? Confidence is a six. Well, it's so interesting that you bring that up because originally we did have consequence as a, a C, or a confidence rather, as a C. It was after consequences. And um, actually in the course of writing the book, we decided to take it out because um, what we realized, and we did actually a big survey um, when we were writing the book, we, um, my co-author had stopped teaching the course in 2018, and so we wanted to make sure it was very updated and had a broader set of perspectives than just the students who studied with her at Stanford Business School, an elite institution. And what we realized through that survey is that it's actually very hard to feel confidence in the midst of a big decision, um, even when you're following a trusted framework. And we didn't want to imply that it was like a step you had to go through is like, you must feel confidence because then if you don't, you know, it makes you actually feel even more uncertain of like, well, I followed all these steps, but now I don't feel confidence. And so am I doing this wrong? Like second guessing, you know, their approach. So, you know, what, because everyone's different, right. In terms of, you know, their, um, the set of, uh, kind of emotions and, and circumstances they're bringing to the decision. And we're not guaranteeing that they have to, you know, that they will feel confident or requiring that they have to, but we're saying it's much more likely if you follow this approach, um, but reserving the right for it to be okay if someone isn't feeling so confident. And often, you know, once you get a little bit of distance and once, you know, some of the outcomes start playing out, you're, you do feel that confidence, but um, it's, it's so interesting they bring that up because we had a lot of discussions about this. Of like, should this be a formal C or should we just say it's a likely byproduct if you follow these other Cs that you will feel more confidence about the decision. That's the feedback we've gotten from people as we've you know had people read the book and we've been running workshops and, um, and uh, certainly at a lot of companies as part of the promotion of the book. People say, oh, I, you know, I've just been so helpful. I feel much more confident as a result of talking through this decision decision with someone else. Um, but, uh, but where you decided not to formalize it, but I love that you, that you brought that up and that it was your sixth C. It might be, it might be, make, might make sense for you uh, and maybe for someone, some of your other listeners. And after listening to your insights there, um, and that discussion, I'm, I'd actually like to remove it because if we only made decisions that we were confident about, completely 100% confident about, we would never make any decisions at all. Um, sometimes it's okay to take uh, calculated gamble or calculated risk, but often at times risk comes with having no confidence, uh, but having calculation or, uh, yeah, I would like to remove that uh, based on what you had to say. <laughs> well, I, I love that you that you saw it there, and I, I think it's helpful to know that it, it can increase your confidence to follow it, but uh, that it does not, it's not a requirement. And I certainly have moments where I've doubted decisions, and I, I don't mean to imply at all that like you'll feel 100% confident about your decisions 100% of the time if you follow the framework, or that they'll turn around right 100% of the time, right? I, I do think that monkey wrenches are frequent. <laughs> Now we've covered the five C's from a kind of theoretical point of view and perhaps the listeners really wanting to implement this to their daily operating system or their daily decision making, making routines. How can they go from, how can we take this from theory to practicality? Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that there are likely um, a number of questions that anyone has in their mind at any given time uh, related to money and love. So, um, even just in the course of writing the book, my co-author and I uh, both decided, uh, both had questions about moving. Um, we used the same framework. I just shared a little bit of mine. We decided actually not to move 
um, she decided to move. Um, we decided to switch our kids' schools. Um, my husband started his own business. I then left my job and started my own business. So there's been lots of major life decisions that we've made in the process of, of writing the book and, and testing out the framework. And we've sort of been road testing it, um, you know, as we were building it. And I've shared, you know, there were different iterations of the five C's. But, you know, I, I what I suggest is that people, you know, think about the decision that's top of mind for them. And then at in each chapter of the book has an exercise at the end. And the first chapter has a worksheet where we um, walk people through the steps of the five C's and have them kind of jot it down, um, jot down their thoughts. And um, that can be a really helpful way to turn it from theory into practice because they're applying it to something that is likely keeping them up at night already. Um, we also have, if, if people are like, yeah, I don't have time to read the book. I'm more of like a podcast or audio person. We have a 21-day text-based course that um, on our website, moneylovebook.com, people can go to and sign up for that course. And it is like audio files plus um, texts that you can use to apply to a money love question that's top of mind too. So for me, this is not just an academic exercise. It's absolutely about putting it into practice and applying it to a question that is maybe swirling around in your own head and you feel you know very uncertain about. Thank you, Abby. We've discovered that, and pardon the pun, money and love hold hands. When building a new relationship, perhaps when you're on the dating scene or you're meeting someone new, how do you introduce a concept such as money, which is usually such an unsexy feeling um, when you're in this new novel romantic relationship? How do you, I guess, avoid dimming the light or d dimming the spark in a first date or a first few dates by bringing up the concept such as money? Yeah, well, it's um, it's a really good question. It's so important to have transparent conversations about money in a relationship. But you're right; we are it's taboo. We are not, you know, shown models of how to do this. I like to say, like, I really want to see the romantic comedy where people sit down and reveal their educational debt to each other. Like, it's just <laughs> it's just not done, right? But it's so important because you would never want to um, walk down the aisle with someone that you didn't realize had, you know, loads of debt. Um, and certainly, you know, I'd hope you would reveal that. But, you know, what, what I'd like to say is before you go on a trip together, um, you know, so maybe not the first date, but maybe, you know, certainly by like the fourth or fifth, you, you know, have a, you know, say like, I'd love to just like have a financial date if you can. Money is important to me. I know it's important. Uh, it's a cause of a lot of relationship troubles and certainly a lot of divorces are because of financial disagreements. And so can we like have a date where we agree to talk to each other about money, whether that's our own financial stories, we all have them, right, in terms of how we were raised and decisions we see our parents making that, you know, either were positive or negative. Um, we have, again, suggested questions in the book that could be um, used. One of my favorites is, what do you like to spend reckless amounts of money on? Because <laughs> again, we all have those. Um, and, and just like, demystify it a bit like have the top have the conversation and then you know um certainly say like if we want to continue to build this relationship it's important to me to be transparent about finances and so like how you know what how did how would you feel about you know having regular conversations about this i mean i certainly um think that one of the reasons that my husband and i uh, have had such an um, effective partnership is that we were forced to have these conversations by nature of being in this class together before we felt ready. Um, my co-author has this expression of like, it feels you're, like you're standing on a really tall diving board before you have these conversations. And, you know, some people just don't want to jump off, but the diving board is not getting any lower. And so better to, you know, take the plunge and have the conversation before you get too far into the relationship and realize, you know, that you have, you know, some incompatibility, uh, whether it's related to money or whether it's related to, you know, some other important uh, aspects of life, spirituality, you know, having children, where you want to live. Um, better to, to know that uh, early on before you uh, make a lot of decisions to tie your life with someone who ultimately is not going to be the best partner for you. 
Oh, Abby, I hope that none of my future dates listen to this podcast because if they ask me on a first date, what do I recklessly spend money on? I will never get another date ever again because it would be like <laughs> energy drinks and protein bars and <laughs> things like that, takeout. Um, so I hope none of my future dates listen to such this such, such podcast or listen to this pragmatic advice. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I genuinely do love it. I, I really do. It's such fundamental advice that we should all be sharing with um, those around us. People might be listening to this conversation, given that we're both consultants or ex-consultants. I work at KPMG as a a management consultant and given your your career at Bain, some might think that we are approaching love, which could be deemed as a psychological thing um, in a a very logical manner. Love can be embodied uh, it can be described as like a warm, r- romantic spark when we meet someone. Um, it's often hard to logically explain. Like sometimes we're attracted to how someone moves or how they smell or all the little idiosyncrasies that make them them. All these could be very exciting to you and that you fall in love with them, but they might have very different financial objectives or financial fragility. Can you compromise or should you compromise on financial security for emotional compatibility? And equally, should you compromise on emotional compatibility just for financial security? How how do you bridge that um, dichotomy? So we certainly are not saying that you shouldn't listen to your heart when it comes to finding a partner. Um, That's not at all what I would want people to take away. But we advocate for not letting your heart uh, ignore red flags that your brain might be picking up. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, when we are in that honeymoon period, when we are just like obsessed with someone and want to spend all this time with them, um, we're in system one thinking, right? And we are kind of making impulsive decisions because we are in a really good mood and a heightened emotion of like the beginnings of a romance, which is amazing. Um, But that state does not continue decades into a relationship, (laughs) right? It just can't. Um, And so you suddenly do find yourself with someone with whom you are building a long-term partnership. And so just like you would with any business partner, you do need to have conversations about the ways in which you are compatible for the long term. Um, It doesn't mean that you can't have all the romance and the sexy stuff like that. You know, certainly we don't want to take that part away. But um, this is why we're advocating a series of conversations. And actually, you know, it turns out that when you are vulnerable with someone and you do share um, very deeply seated values and goals and um, money stories and things that you might not reveal on those first dates, it does breed intimacy. Um, my co-author's second husband was a psychiatrist, and so he taught her this, de- this definition of intimacy, which is into me see. So when you are having you know, um, a close relationship with someone, you want to let them into what you are feeling at any given time, both about the relationship, about you know, your own life. And when you do that, it actually breeds closeness. And so having these types of conversations about seemingly, you know, um, intense, you know, romance killer topics actually is pretty romantic because it means, you know, hey, I'm trying to figure out if you're the person I want to spend my life with. Um, And that means that we need to have some conversations that are, you know, maybe uncomfortable, maybe awkward, may not be the first thing I want to bring up. And don't, you know, don't do it on a first date. Like, get see see if your you know, the spark is there. Um, but do it before, you know, certainly before you move in together, certainly before anyone proposes. Like, do it well before that time. I love it, Abby. Given that the nature of this podcast is using transparent origin stories as a self-development tool, I'm scared now that loads of my listeners are falling in love with my guests, given how transparent and vulnerable they are on this podcast. <laughs> Abby, you're going to have many more fans now. 
<laughs> well, I uh, no, I mean, this is the this. I really wish this book and you know the course had found me earlier in life. So I am so um, delighted that you invited me to be on this podcast. I love the mission that you're you know what you're doing and sharing with your listeners. So um, the feeling is mutual. I'm big fans of of your audience as well. Oh, thank you. If I were to ask you one final question, Abby. If you were to help or hold the hand of the listeners or anybody to make one universal decision, given that you are the SME on decision making, what decision would you like to help them with the most? What, what, or, or, or to frame that, what decision do you think people often get wrong? I think it's the decision about what they want, the decision about who they are, and what they want to pursue in life. And that is both professionally and personally. And so if I could help them, it would be to know themselves better and to know to have the clarity that will help make all of the other decisions easier because they are so tuned in to what will make them feel fulfilled and have purpose and meaning in their life. I love it, Abby. It's been such a pleasure, genuine such a pleasure to have you dial in from the States and to the Scottish podcast. Uh, I use this podcast as my own university curriculum and I get to learn from the best of the best. And you are the best uh, when it comes to making decisions or giving advice on making decisions. I really appreciate your time today, Abby. I've loved your book. I've loved this conversation. I've loved all the other podcasts that you've been part of. If people feel the same and they want to reach out, where can they find you online? Um, well, thank you. This has been such a delight, and I'm so glad that you reached out. Um, we have a book website, moneylovebook.com, and they can also follow me at abby.davison on Instagram and at da Abby Davison on Twitter. Perfect. Thank you so much, Abby. Thank you so much, David.